charge transfer in solution. Now, this is a prototy prototypical example of condensed phase electron transfer reactions. And condensed phase electron transfer reactions are interesting because they play a key part in most biological synthetical energy transfer pathways. The problem with them is accurate simulations are incredibly demanding <coughs> because they involve thousands of complexly coupled atoms and quantum effects are important because we're transferring, in this case, an electron, which is usually, very, which always is quantum mechanical. So before I talk about it coupled to the solvent, I'm just going to talk about ferrocene, ferrocene, charge transfer in vacuum. So this is a graphical representation of it. On top, the blue is the ferrocene and the red is the ferrocinium. On the left is the donor configuration and on the right is the acceptor configuration. So the donor configuration is the ferrocene on top and the acceptor has the, uh, ferrocene, on the ferrocene on the bottom. And this is the Hamiltonian system. And you can see that they're off diagonal terms, so the donor is coupled, there's coupling between the donor and acceptor states. Which means that if you were to construct, set this thing up in the donor configuration and let it evolve over time, it will eventually become the acceptor configuration. And it will also, if you keep on letting go, it'll go back to the donor configuration. So this is a plot. So you see if you start, this is a plot of the donor population. So if you start at 100%, like 100 of the donor population, you'll go to zero and you go back up and you go and you keep on oscillating. These oscillations won't dissipate without coupling to a solvent. And the oscillation frequency is related to the coupling between the donor and the acceptor states. So now what happens when we couple in a solvent, put in the solution. So now when it's in the donor configuration, it has a completely different interaction with the solvent that it does in the acceptor configuration. And this really w changes how the time evolution of this behaves. So what we're really interested in is what the donor population dynamics are. Now, a straightforward simulation where you just plug this into the Schrodinger equation and solve it is impossible because, as most of you know, the cost of quantum simulation scales exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom. And there are a lot of them. So this is a very demanding challenge. Fortunately, not all the degrees of freedom in these things require quantum treatments. Like the solvent can be treated almost, the majority of the characteristics, key characteristics of the solvent can be obtained just by molecular dynamic simulations alone. So the real goal to making these simulations possible is a judicious application, uh, application of quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. So the way you do this is you decompose the problem into a system and a solvent. So in our case, the system is going to be ferrocene, ferrocinium, and it's going to be treated using fully quantum methods. And the solvent, which we're using hexane here, is treated classically. And the real question is, is how do you interact the two? So we want to couple the system, the quantum system, to the classical solvent. This is really tricky because quantum mechanics is, not, is delocal in nature and classical mechanics is local in nature. So you can't usually just straightforward use wave functions because the non-locality of wave functions is, does not really work well with classical mechanics. You have this, if you have a really delocalized system, you don't really know what forces to give to the classical part. So we really need something that is local in nature, but is capable to capture the quantum, the quantum non-locality. And the way we do that is we use the Feynman path integral, which sums over all possible paths connecting the initial and final configuration. So this is kind of a toy example. So each of these is a different path between the initial and the final configuration. So in the path integral, you would sum over each of them, and each would contribute a different phase. And so, so each path is local in space. So you can easily couple a path to classical mechanics. But because you're summing over a whole bunch of different paths, you can still capture quantum non-locality. And the way we do this, so when you kind of put this all together and do it, you end up with the quantum classical path integral, which combines the path integral representation of the system with the classical treatment of the solvent. And it rigorously describes the interaction between the system and the solvent. And each, so each path will apply a unique set of forces. Each path applies a unique set of forces to the solvent, and the solvent in turn will contribute uh, different phases to the system, paths, to the path zone. And the result is a quantum superposition, effective quantum superposition of a classically propagated solvent. 
So this is the key equation um, that we deal with. So S is the coordinate of the system, P is a vector of the solvent's configuration, and it Q is, uh, Q is the solvent's configuration, P is the solvent's momentum. Uh, what we're really looking for is the reduced density matrix, which is where we integrate out all the solvent's coordinates, and we just look at what happens to, so we take the true density matrix and we integrate all the solvent's coordinates. So we get just what's happening with respect to the system. So P is the initial distribution of the solvent, and Q is the quantum influence functional. And the quantum influence functional is what contains all the information of that path sum. And as you can see, it depends on the initial configuration of the solvent, as well as where you're looking at for the system. And so this is a plot from five, four different initial configurations, what the quantum influence functional, what one of the elements of the quantum influence functional looks like, function looks like. And you can see it, it doesn't look at all like you'd expect some sort of reaction, uh, uh, dissipative reaction to look like. But if you actually average them, you get something that looks much closer. So this sum overall, the integral over all initial conditions is really important. And if you keep on doing that, you actually get something that looks very much like you'd expect from this type of reaction. So the solvent trajectories are what I'm calling what's involved in the quantum influence functional. So it's the sum over all possible it involves the sum of all possible system, system solvent configuration. So let's say we pick an initial condition, initial solvent configuration. So that can propagate under the donor surface or the acceptor, acceptor uh, forces. And you now have, after one time step, you end up with two different configurations, two different solvent configurations. And you do it again, you get four. So you have the donor donor configuration, the donor acceptor configuration, the acceptor donor configuration, and the acceptor acceptor configuration. So this is, as that toy graph I was showing you before, these are four separate different paths that when you sum them, so each path of these is local in space, but the sum allows you to create an effective quantum superposition of these different uh, solvent configurations. The only problem is, so, and if we extend this though, you end up with something that keeps on increasing the number of trajectories with the number of time steps. So you would think that this would be impossible because in principle, all time points are coupled. So what happens at the earlier time points will affect the later time points, so you'll just have this exponential growth that you'll never solve. But the thing is the interaction that we're actually interested in, the system solvent interaction, which we're interested in, is described by time correlation functions, which decay irreversibly. So we can eventually the, 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 the dependence on the earlier time points effectively goes to zero. So we, can, we define a memory time, which is the time beyond which the system, the, we can ignore the earlier time points. And this is done just by convergence, which means because we can do this, we can iterate this. So graphically, so say that beyond this point, it doesn't matter which path it was on. So we just drop it, and we keep on doing this, and it gives us iterative. So we're not exponentially increasing the number. We can keep the number of paths fixed. <coughs> so the key advantages of QCPI is there are no ad hoc approximations, and there are no restrictions on the, the potential of the solvent we're using. You can use any type of solvent. You can use harmonic, atomistic, anything you want. Any toy model you want, you can just do it. And you can use pre-existing packages for the classical integration. And it's highly parallelizable. This is what makes Blue Waters really nice for this because each initial condition, you can put the thousands of initial conditions you want on different cores and just run them. And additionally, these path sums tend to use a lot of memory. So it really is nice to have because we're trying to fit you know, a large number of thousands of these things, thousands of classical trajectories on a core. It's nice to have a lot of memory. So I kind of talked more about the method. Now I'm going to talk about the particular application that I did. So we really want a detailed atomistic description of this. So that involves really two key interactions, the solvent-solvent interaction, which is the inter and the system-solvent interaction. The solvent-solvent interaction has bonds, the only, and, but the system-solvent has no bonds. And the, they both have non-bond interactions. So for this, we use standard charm parameters for the hexane. But the ferrocene, we had to parameterize because there weren't really any normal parameters for that. And so we fit them to ab initio calculations that we did using Gaussian. And we used VMD plugins, FFTK, and Peritool to kind of generate the 
the parameter set, and we followed the CGNFF guidelines to generate the parameters. So the basic details for our simulation were that we used a 13 angstrom shell of hexane, which has 66 molecules. Uh, we increased the size and found that uh, for the added computational cost of having more hexane, we didn't gain any real difference in the solution, so we just went with the 13 angstrom shell. We used periodic boundary conditions. Uh, we kept the simulation cell fixed in space. Uh, we used our initial distribution was an MPT ensemble at 300 Kelvin and one atmospheric temp pressure. And our classical time step was approximately two femtoseconds, which we, and we did all classical integration using NAMD. And our quantum time step was 24.2 femtoseconds, and, which is 12 classical time steps. And that was a convergence parameter. And this is an uh, image of the simulation cell. The highlighted portion here, the lighter portion here is the actual shell that was included is the 13 angstroms, and the rest is periodic replicas. So before, I, earlier I talked about how this is able to capu, uh, capture solvent delocalization. We, so, and this is kind of a picture of that. So this shows three separate of those solvent configuration, solvent trajectories overlaid on each other. So, and you can see that they're separated, that the, the hydrogens here, that they're, they're, the, the hexanes aren't really one single thing, but kind of spread out in space. And that's because these different configurations have felt different forces from the system during the course of their evolution. And this was an image, this would be a video showing that, that. So we start off with the same configuration. You can see this just looks like a normal hexane. And these are three different things, but evolving over time. And you can see that as time goes on, they start to split apart. So each of these different configurations, because they're feeling different forces from the system, evolve separately. And this is what we capture. And so we capture this type of non-locality in the solvent that is being felt because the system itself is quantum. And you can see at the later times, they're very different. Like, the, it really matters. Like, it, you're very different solvent behavior at longer times. And this is the actual uh, results that we get. These are kind of really the force of their kind. They, their, their electron transfer reaction, like completely at, using completely atomistic forces. Uh, so this is really highly accurate, really new results. Um, and you can see, like, instead of before where it oscillated, when you actually have the coupled system, that it actually decays like you'd expect it to. So the next thing to ask, which is, is harmonic approximations and how do they fit into this? Because har harmonic approximations, where we just treat the solvent instead of as an atomistic thing, as just a bath of oscillators. Now, these are really useful because it's really nice to have, you can get a lot of insight from simplified models that you might lose with the fully complex thing. So understanding harmonic models are really, having harmonic models is really useful. So we're interested in understanding how, wh how well the harmonic models match to the atomistic system so we can figure out where they actually lie, where the boundaries of applicability of these lie is, will be really useful. So these models are able to reproduce the effective system. We're only interested in, in these models in reproducing the effective system solvent interaction which means that it's not really a Taylor series expansion. It doesn't really match the actual behavior of the solvent itself. It only matches how it interacts with the system. And as I mentioned before, these can be highly accurate, but only when linear response is valid. And that's kind of really what we're looking for. We're looking for where the validity of linear response is and where it's not, and how valid it is in, under certain circumstances. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes to talk about uh, how you map an atomistic solvent to a harmonic bath, or how we do it. So let's just say that this is our solvent. This is the free energy surface of the donor. This is some. This is not real. I just made it up. I just kind of just to kind of give you a, a visual example. Uh, this is the the surface for the. And assume this is the surface for the acceptor. So these are the two overlaid. So let's say that our initial configuration is here, and we're just going to do a normal classical simulation and kind of propagate this through time. And so at this time point, the zero time point, the energy gap. You just kind of jump it. So this is the energy gap between the solvent, the solvent, the donor configuration, and the acceptor configuration. And you calculate this energy gap as you evolve the 
thing on the donor surface. So you get lots of different energy gaps. And you can use this, these different energy gaps to construct an energy gap order correlation function. And from the energy gap order correlation function, you can map it to the dynamics by taking, by the spectral density, uh, which by using a whole bunch of steps. The first step, the first relationship that we use is that we say that the, we can map, we assume after we get the atomistic autocorrelation function, energy gap autocorrelation function, we assume that it's harmonic. And then we can use that, we say that it's harmonic because the goal is to construct a harmonic one, a harmonic model that matches that exact same autocorrelation function because that's all we're trying to match, which captures the system solvent interaction. So once we have that, we, mat, we figure out, we then use a, the relationship between the position and the force to map the harmonic energy gap to a force autocorrelation function, which we then can integrate <coughs> using this equation to get the spectral density. And once you have the spectral density, you can get the, the Cs and omegas for these, um, equa for these uh, representations of the solvent. Uh, to represent the solvent as a bath of oscillate, harmonic oscillators. So for this, for the hexane, this is the energy gap order correlation function, and this is the spectral density. So when you do that, so this is kind of the end of this. So the blue line is the harmonic results, and the dots are the atomistic results that we got before. So you can see in this case that the, there's an excellent agreement between the harmonic results and the atomistic results which is kind of really interesting if you think about it, because the only thing they really share in common is that they have that same energy gap order correlation function. But beyond that, there's no relationship. So linear response can be really powerful, especially in this situation, which you'd kind of expect it to be, because there's, you know, it's electron transfer, and there's not a lot, not really strongly coupled system. The system is not really co strongly coupled to the solvent. So additionally, we, calculate, we can calculate the rates. So the, the red line is what you'd get from Marcus theory. And the green line is what you get from the long time limit if you actually look at the, the, the actual dynamics and calculate the long time limit. So you can see from these rates that, you know, the decay is really not an exponential and that you really need the full dynamics to get a sense. You need to really simulate the full dynamics to get a sense of what's going on. You can't just kind of do a, a long time limit calculation and figure out what's happening or Marcus theory. So just kind of as the summary is that, you know, condensed phase quantum dynamics is a difficult problem, but you can solve it with QCPI. And that despite its simplicity, linear response is a really valid method, really powerful, in this, especially in this case. Uh, and these are, so the knowledge of my group, uh, Blue Waters and NSF for funding. <laughs>